Well, uh, my name is Ren. I am a nursery inspector uh, with the Indiana DNR. Um, I am in a small division called the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. And today um, I'll be talking to you about invasive insects. Um, let me see if I can get it to switch. So I did want to mention a little bit about our division just because most people have never heard of us. Um, now I can't see the Zoom. I hope I'm still on here. Um, okay, so we have kind of four primary duties that we do in the Division of Entomology. We are nursery inspectors, so we go out to any place that is selling plants, um, whether that is a large-scale grower, um, a box store like Home Depot or Lowe's, um, small greenhouses, et cetera. And we are looking for pests and diseases and invasive plants. Um, and then we also do phytosanitary inspection. So um, anybody who is wanting to sell um, plant commodities for overseas or out of state, they usually have to get a phytosanitary inspection, which is where um, we come out and we look at the commodity. We make sure that they are meeting the guidelines for another country or another state um, so that they're not spreading invasive species or diseases. Um, we also do apiary inspection and survey. So if you're a beekeeper, um, we do offer apiary inspections. And we also, um, a big part of our job is invasive species. So we do monitoring, we do treatments, and we do a lot of outreach too. So most of you probably already know this, but in case you don't, um, the definition of invasive that we use, um, it has two components. The first is that um, whatever it is, whether it's an insect, a plant, um, a mammal, a disease, it has to be non-native to the ecosystem that we're considering. And it also has to do harm. So in the Venn diagram, um, you can see there are plenty of things that are not native here, um, like tulips, like boxwood, et cetera but they don't really cause harm. So we don't consider those to be invasive. Then there are native plants like poison ivy and poison sumac that do cause harm, um, but they aren't, uh, or they're not invasive because they are native. And then there are things in the middle like honeysuckle, purple loosestrife. Those cause harm um, to the ecosystem and they aren't from here. So that's what invasive means. There are a lot of reasons to care about invasive species. Um, they can limit the use of lands, inhibit recreational pursuits, uh, destabilize soil, alter water hydrology. Um, the natural ecosystem of an area can be drastically altered when native plants can't compete with invasive ones. Um, another thing is that a lot of invasive plants, um, wildlife species either don't feed on them or they get sick when they eat them or they don't provide the same level of nutrition. Um, over time, this can also alter population numbers and where the populations are found. Invasive insects can change the landscape as well, um, in some cases even decimating entire species. Um, probably, if you guys live in Indiana or the Midwest, you're familiar with the emerald ash borer, and that is um, an invasive insect that caused the deaths of millions of ash trees because it was accidentally introduced in an, in an environment where it didn't belong. Uh, whether we're dealing with invasive insects or plants, um, the money spent to combat them is just enormous. It's estimated that every single year we spend over $100 billion on um, invasive species, whether that's detecting them, control, controlling them, or eradicating them. There are many ways um, that invasive species can be introduced into a new environment. Um, for insects um, in particular, a lot of times um, they're moved on firewood or um, sometimes their egg masses are moved on basically anything that's left outside. So it can hitch a ride on um, a ship, a rail car, a semi-truck, a camper, any vehicle that's moving long distances. And some species of insects can also be moved in soil, um, solid wood packing material, that's a real problem. Nearly any agricultural product like um, seeds and nursery stock. So there are a lot of ways. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that pretty much most invasive species enter because of human um, interference. There are literally hundreds of invasive species um, in the United States already known, uh, with more being identified every year. Um, each of these pests has a significant impact on our natural resources. Um, today, I'm going to focus on seven of them. Um, 
And these are the ones that I want to talk about. If it has an asterisk next to it, uh, that means that we have found it or it has an established population here. So there's Lymantria dispar, which is currently called spongy moth. It's formerly known as gypsy moth. We have hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate, elongate hemlock scales, both um, scales, uh, pests on hemlock, Asian longhorn beetle, box tree moth, Asian giant hornet and spotted lanternfly. Getting right into it, um, first one that I'm going to talk about is now um, officially known as spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth. Um, it doesn't belong in America. It's native to parts of Europe, Asia, and even Northern Africa. And it was first brought to the US intentionally in the 1860s um, by a French scientist who had a really bright idea of breeding spongy moths with silk moths with the hopes of creating a silk market in the US um, that would be inexpensive to feed. And um, that's because silk moths are really particular about what they eat. Uh, spongy moths are not, they're generalists. They feed on a lot of species. So the idea was interbreeding them and then they would be easy to take care of. Uh, the problem was that they're not even closely related, the two moths, silk moths and spongy moths. They can't interbreed. It was a failed experiment. Um, one way that you can identify spongy moth is um, they have a distinctive marking on the adult moth's wings. Um, it's a chevron that's pointing to a dot. Uh, the female is the white moth that you see in the picture. Um, so it's usually pretty easy to see on her wings. The male is the darker brown color, so it's a little more difficult to see. But a lot of times on um, the life stage that people see and report is either the egg mass, um, which I'll show you in a few slides, or the caterpillars. And the caterpillars are the ones that do the damage. So even though um, there wasn't a silk trade created, uh, there was an expensive new industry created, which was basically just controlling spongy moths um, who had escaped. They readily feed on over 500 different types of plants. And what I have here is just showing a small list of what they can feed on. Uh, they love oak, uh, and those are usually the first species that you'll see defoliated. But when they can't find oaks, it really they can live on almost anything. Since that first introduction uh, in the 1860s, spongy moth has found obviously some very suitable habitat. This is a um, map of their range from a few years ago. Um, it's currently established in the northern part of Indiana, as you can see on the blue squares at the top part of the state. Um, and it can cause defoliation of trees. It can interfere substantially with your outdoor activities. And it's just a general nuisance to homeowners. It's the larval or caterpillar stage uh, that causes the most damage. They feed voraciously as they grow um, and are getting ready to pupate. And several years in a row um, of defoliation can kill even a healthy adult, huge tree. Um, adults are actually a non-feeding life stage. They don't eat in that life stage. Um, their really only goal in the adult life stage is to seek out a mate to start the life cycle over again. Uh, the females don't fly, um, but the males do. So to attract mates, the females um, produce a pheromone, um, a mating pheromone that the males use to find them. And it's actually one kind of creative way that we've come up with to treat for this insect. We basically saturate the area with a synthetic um, mating pheromone so that the moths cannot um, find each other and it disrupts the life cycle. After they mate, um, the females do look for areas to lay their egg masses and um, they're the little tan oval shapes in all of these pictures. The egg masses can be laid pretty much anywhere. Um, they contain between 500 and 1,000 eggs. And this is the life stage that's most often transported to new areas. So on that map that I showed a few slides back, um, the blue is kind of where they're established. But we occasionally have spongy moss pop up in areas that are not even in any of these zones, like the edge of the border. Um, and that's usually because somebody accidentally transported an egg mass to a new area. Um, to help prevent the spread of this and other invasive species, it's really important that if you're, especially if you're in an infested area, you check your belongings, anything left outside before you leave. Um, we really think that campers are, and RVs are a way that people move this a lot. In the summer, they're camping in an infested area, they go back home and they bring egg masses with them. Hemlock woolly adelgid um, is another invasive insect that we have dealt with in the past in Indiana. Um, they're sap suckers, um, kind of in the same order as something like a cicada or a plant hopper. 
Uh, they can be found already in um, Western North America, where it's likely that they've been present for thousands of years. So um, the hemlocks in that area have adapted to them. Um, they have natural predators and there's some host resistance. Um, separately, there are populations also found in the Eastern United States, states um, which are genetically linked to um, populations that have been found in Japan. So these were likely introduced in the last 100 years or so. Um, and they're considered invasive because they do actually do harm in this area. Sorry, my slide's not changing. Okay. Um, so they have kind of a really complex life cycle that I won't get into too much. But um, one thing that's interesting is that they're all females. And so um, they do not need to find a mate to complete their life cycle. They develop parthenogenetically or asexually. Um, and so they have an egg stage. They have um, several nymph in star stages and then an adult. And there will be two overlapping generations per year. Um, the life stage that most people end up finding if they do find it um, in their yard is um, the one on the top left. Those are the egg sacs. They're kind of cottony white, um, really distinct on the base of the needles. Um, there are four species of hemlock, as you can see, native to the U U.S. Um, in the native stands of eastern and Carolina hemlock, um, hemlock woolly adelgid has been really devastating. It causes severe de defoliation and tree death. This map kind of shows um, the historic range of hemlocks in the U.S. The dark brown and yellow areas are areas where hemlock woolly adelgid has been found. And remember, this is an invasive species. It's not native here. Um, the two pink counties that you can see um, in Michigan, those were detected uh, in 2015, and they are attempting eradication in that block. We also found hemlock woolly adelgid um, in LaPorte County, Indiana in 2012, um, just in a couple of landscape trees in someone's yard. It has been successfully eradicated at that site, um, but we still do pretty extensive surveying every year, um, even though we're 10 years out from that, um, just to make sure that it's not there because we want to protect our um, small native stands of eastern hemlock and landscape plantings. But I should reiterate that um, at this time, there are no known infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid in Indiana. So this is definitely something, I mean, along with anything that I present about today, we want you to report it if you think you found it. Another um, threat to hemlocks is this scale insect called elongate hemlock scale. Uh, they have about 50 known host species, but they do really like hemlocks, of course. Uh, it's another one that has been introduced from Japan, and it was first found a little over 100 years ago in New York. Um, they're really small, like these, these are all, um, these pictures were all taken with like either a hand lens or a magnifying glass. Um, let's see here. Uh, usually you wouldn't even notice this at first in a small infestation, um, probably, only when there's a heavy infestation would you start to notice the damage, which can include um, yellow banding on the needles. Um, eventually, the needles yellow and they drop off. And severe damage from a heavy infestation can actually lead to tree death over time. The branches will start to die back and the tree will die. Um, so scale insects, for those of you that haven't heard of a scale insect before, they're um, really small insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts. They feed on uh, plant sap. They do secrete a waxy coating um, for defense and they become stationary in adulthood. So um, they have a crawler stage, that's the nymph stage. And then once they find a good spot and they become an adult, they stay there for the rest of their life. Uh, they can overwinter either as um, an egg or as an adult. Um, the overwintered eggs hatch in the early spring and then overwintered females um, lay eggs at that same time. So they have um, the crawler stage, the stage that moves around um, for an extended period of time. And they are the ones that um, distribute. So they move on to new growth um, where they settle, feed, and develop into adults again. And the adult males in the lower right corner, they do actually have wings. Um, because of that life cycle where they have multiple generations and they have some life stages that move, some that don't, um, control of them can be really difficult because um, it, typically you would control them with a chemical insecticide. But that insecticide doesn't penetrate that uh, waxy cuticle. So um, you really have to target the crawler life stage, but there are multiple generations per year. So it, it's difficult to treat for these. 
Um, it has been found in several eastern states, um, and we do occasionally intercept it um, in Indiana. We don't have it known to be established, but it, it's definitely a possibility at this point. Um, like with most pests, human assisted movement is critical to um, its successful invasion into new areas. Um, because like I said, it's a tiny insect. They do have flying life stages, but those are the males. Um, it, it gets moved by humans. So the place that we've been finding it pretty much every year since I got this job is on holiday greenery brought in from other states. Um, if you buy holiday greenery, you should be inspecting it, um, not just for elongate hemlock scale, but for any bugs. Um, it's really supposed to come in clean. That's not always the case, but uh, you should look for it. When the season's over, we ask people to not um, just toss their material into the woods or into a compost pile. You should try to properly dispose of it. So um, a lot of cities or counties will have a tree and greenery pickup or drop off location. That's one thing you could do. You can also um, burn it or you can uh, put it in a garbage bag, tie it, put it in a second garbage bag and tie it and then just send it to the landfill. And there's a pretty good chance it's not going to escape if you dispose of it like that. You should also um, always know and follow local ordinances, like some places don't want you burning things. So know that before you follow that advice. Um, these pictures were taken just in the last couple of years by DNR inspectors. Um, this was infested with hemlock, uh, um, elongate hemlock scale, and this was all brought in from out of state. This next one um, is the Asian longhorn beetle. This is one that we're um, definitely pretty worried about. Um, it's native to Asia, just like a lot of these are. Um, it's become invasive um, both in Europe and North America. And they have uh, this really unique kind of beautiful pattern on them. Um, it's, a it's a long black body with white spots. They're over um, one and a half inches long and they have really, really long antennae as you can see. That's why they're called a longhorn beetle. They um, have found a lot of suitable hosts in the US. Um, their favorites are by far maple trees, but if maples aren't available, as you can see from this list, there's plenty of other things that it will feed on. So um, buckeyes, elms, and willows, they also really like, but they can survive and complete their life cycle on any of these other trees that are listed. So um, for their life cycle, uh, the eggs hatch in the fall, and then the larvae, um, which are these kind of big worms that you can see in the second um, from the top left picture. Um, the larvae burrow under the bark uh, where they begin feeding. And as they grow and get bigger, um, they move deeper and deeper into the actual heartwood of the tree um, and in the branches as well. And they can damage the structural integrity of the tree. Um, they create long galleries um, as they burrow and these can make branches weak um, and prone to breakage. A severe infestation definitely can um, impact the overall structural integrity of the tree. Uh, the larvae and the pupae, which are inside of the tree, are protected from cold winters. Um, and the next spring, they will emerge as adults. Um, they come out of these perfectly round, um, three quarters, three or three eighths of an inch in diameter um, exit holes, which you can see in the bottom left. Trees usually don't show any obvious signs of decline until the infestation level is already really high. Um, so your tree could have these and you wouldn't know it unless you were looking for it until there are a lot of them. Um, you can scout your trees for Asian longhorn beetle and that's something I would recommend, especially if you have maples. Um, when scouting, you can look for these huge um, exit holes. This is a full length um, pencil that this guy put in here and that's a really good indicator that you have Asian longhorn beetle and not something else if you can stick a pencil into it. Those are the exit holes caused by the adults. Um, in this picture, you can see um, exit holes and oviposition pits. The oviposition pit is where the female um, adult beetle, she chews a little depression in the bark and lays eggs there. You can also look for um, frass at the base of the tree um, in the notches of branches or um, coming out of the egg laying sites. And if branches break off, you wanna just take a quick look at them and look for large tunnels deep inside the wood. There are a few other um, insects that can cause something like this on things other than maple, but if you see this on maple, this is something we would definitely want you to report. Okay, so um, Asian longhorn beetle has been found in a lot of states over the last 25 years. Um, it has been separately introduced over and over and over accidentally um, from woodpacking material. 
It was first discovered in the US in 1996 um, in New York. And there are areas currently in New York, Massachusetts, Ohio, and South Carolina where they have active um, Asian longhorn beetle populations. They are working to eradicate those populations, but it's very costly and time consuming. Like I said, it's been found in Ohio um, in 2011. It was discovered in Claremont County, Ohio, just east of Cincinnati, um, where eradication efforts um, are, under, or are ongoing, but they have been successful in the two outlier populations shown um, to the west. Um, they do continue in the main area. And eradication of this beetle is possible. Like I said, though, it's very costly. Um, they've been introduced into sites in Illinois, New Jersey, and New York, and those sites have been eradicated. This next one is kind of like the up and coming thing that we just heard about in the last few years. Um, it's called box tree moth. It's uh, native to East Asia and it has become a serious pest already in Europe where it is also invasive. Um, there are a lot of boxwood species native there and they really love their boxwoods in Europe. So um, this is a serious problem. Just this past year, um, a nursery in Canada near Niagara Falls accidentally shipped material that was infested to six US states. Um, thankfully, Indiana was not one of those. Um, much of the material was traced down and destroyed, but um, some of it was not able to be found because it had already been sold and the people had paid in cash. So there was really no way to track them down. Um, the regulatory officials in the areas where um, that material went into, they continue to survey for it though and look for it. And we're also doing that in Indiana too, just as a preventative measure. So um, it's not like we're intentionally waiting for these things to come in. We are actively looking for these prior to them arriving. Um, okay, so it's, unfortunately this, this um, insect is really easily moved, um, especially in the egg stage because the eggs are tiny um, and they're usually on the underside of the leaves. So it's something where if you weren't looking for it, you probably wouldn't even notice it in the early stages of infestation. Um, that's how it's believed to be moving so quickly in Europe and now in North America. They do feed primarily on boxwoods, but they um, can complete their life cycle on other plants, including uh, euonymus and holly species. So the caterpillars um, cause defoliation. Um, and once basically all the leaves are gone, they then go on to feed on the bark of the boxwood and they do what's called girdling the stem, um, which is where the plant can no longer conduct nutrients and water up and down its stem. And over time, the, the um, plant dies. Uh, as you can see in this picture, there are multiple life stages um, per year overlapping in time. Uh, this picture shows an egg mass. And like I said, they're really tiny. You probably would never even think that was anything if you saw that, unless you kind of already knew. Uh, the caterpillars are the life stage that we're most likely to notice or um, the webs that they produce. So basically as they're feeding, they create these large webs and they kind of go into the webs to be protected as they feed. <laughs> so once the infestation is really heavy, you're definitely gonna notice something is wrong, but in the early stages, you might not notice. These are the adults, probably not the life stage you would see, but um, I do think that, that the light colored morph is pretty distinct. Um, I've never really seen anything like that with the white triangle and then the brown triangle around it. They're about an inch and a half um, in length. This one is one of my favorites. Um, you have probably already heard of this one. Um, it's been in the news a lot uh, because it was found in Washington um, in 2019. And it was given a really unfortunate moniker that I really don't encourage you to call it, um, but I'll mention it here just once, the murder hornets. Um, we discourage using that um, because it's kind of a name that can cause panic and hysteria in ill-informed people. Uh, there are several common names associated with it. Uh, we like giant hornet or Asian giant hornet for it, and those are the most commonly referred names. Uh, they are a member of the wasp family, and they're the world's largest hornet, uh, native to several places, not here though. Um, and why we care about it is because of the honeybee industry. Um, the honeybee industry in the US is estimated to be worth $4 billion annually and responsible for 22,000 jobs. If this hornet were to become established in the US, um, it could really cause immeasurable damage. In the fall, um, the giant hornets, they seek out and they kill honeybees by beheading them uh, and they take over the hive and use the honeybee larvae to feed their own young. They are not particularly aggressive toward humans 
unless you are getting into their nest or threatening them. And then uh, they do have an extremely powerful sting and they can sting multiple times. <coughs> uh, the stings can cause serious medical complications, especially if you are allergic or if you get a lot of stings. Um, so the possible economic threat to the honeybee industry and um, the threat to human health are just kind of two reasons why we are working really hard to get rid of this in the United States. Currently, it's only found in Washington. Um, it's also been found in British Columbia. Um, so the first giant hornet was detected in September 2019. And a year later in 2020, they found the first nest, which was destroyed. Um, the officials in Washington continue to monitor and survey for it. And they have placed 850 traps um, kind of in, in that larger area. Um, and there are also citizen scientists who have placed an additional 1500 traps that they monitor themselves. And that's led to several more um, confirmed sightings in 2020 and 2021, and the destruction of three more nests. And um, it's really important that they get the nest destroyed quickly uh, before the new queens emerge and mate. Hold on a minute, I just need to get a drink of water. Okay. Um, so the males and the worker hornets, uh, they die in the winter. So that leaves just the um, queens who have already been fertilized to start the new nest the next spring. So for the winter, um, she excavates in the soil or rotting wood or like piles of straw, just basically anywhere where she can be protected from the elements. And then in the spring, uh, she comes out, she looks for a suitable nesting site. Usually they like um, pre-existing underground cavities like rodent burrows, but they also um, have been found to nest in hollow trees. <clears throat> After a suitable site is found, um, she will begin to build the nest and forage and lay eggs and care for the young. And then in the summer, once um, she has enough workers, like usually around 40 workers, she remains in the nest full time to continue laying eggs while the workers um, go about their business. In the late summer and early fall, uh, the colony begins to produce males and next year's queens. And um, it's during that time that the workers start attacking honeybee hives to obtain higher protein food. Uh, they also um, possibly attack other social bees like bumblebees and um, wasps at that time. And then once the hive has been attacked, they defend it like it's their own. Uh, this is kind of something that has caused, it's like the bane of my existence the past two summers. Um, there are a lot of things that can be confused with giant hornet, as you can see from this picture. Oftentimes it's the native cicada killers, um, like I said, native, not invasive, um, that are thought to be giant hornet based on their size alone. They typically are flying in July and August, and we get literally hundreds of calls from people who think that they found a giant hornet at that time. Um, those are the three, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the three bottom left, those are the, the native cicada killers. The two to the right of that, the one with the circle and the one next to it are the Asian giant hornets. Um, so if you look closely, you can see there are some differences. Uh, the thing that we look for, or two things that we look for. One is the pattern on the abdomen. Um, for cicada killers, they have um, some, some teardrop patterns. And for the giant hornets, they just have kind of a, a straight across band. Uh, the other thing is that the cicada killers, their heads are a lot smaller than their thoraxes. Um, whereas with the giant hornets, their heads and thorax are pretty much the same width. The other thing um, that gets confused all the time, and especially this time of year, is something that's in the same genus, Vespa. Um, it, it's the European hornets. These are also not native, but they are kind of, I don't know if the word is naturalized here. They've been here a long time, so they don't cause as much harm as they used to. Um, and right now their queens are flying and their queens are very large. So we are starting to get reports again of Asian giant hornets. So for European hornets, um, one difference is that they definitely can be quite a bit smaller, but there are there is a size, um, the, there's a range of sizes that they can be. So the things to look for, um, one is these uh, shoulder pads. The shoulder pads on the European hornets are a different color than the rest of the thorax. In the um, giant hornets, they are the same color as the thorax. The European hornets, again, have some teardrop shapes, um, whereas the Asian giant hornets are straight across. Um, so 
one thing that I wanted to mention is, um, like I said, we got, a, oops, sorry, we get a huge amount of reports since the media has been reporting on these. Um, to date, none of the hundreds of reports that we all get have been Giant Hornet, and we, as far as we know, do not have it here at this time. Most of the reports, like I said, are cicada killers and European hornets, but we still get a lot of calls for other things on here that to me don't look hardly anything like it, but many people do think look like it. Um, if you find something you suspect is a giant hornet, uh, please report it to us. And um, at the end of this presentation, I'll have information on how to do that. Um, but just because you find a big wasp, it doesn't mean that it's an Asian giant hornet. It's kind of like um, we get a lot of reports of brown recluses and it's just because someone found a, a small brown spider. Just because you find a brown spider, it doesn't mean it's a brown recluse. Same thing with shield shaped bugs. Um, we get a lot of reports of kissing bugs um, and that's not ever what it ends up being because those aren't even known to occur here. So there are a lot of um, harmful or invasive species that have native lookalikes that are harmless. Um, and the average person just doesn't really have enough entomological knowledge to know the difference. So while we are happy to take reports, it's not always the worst possible thing. Um, last up, uh, this is a new one for us, um, the spotted lanternfly. It's a plant hopper. Um, it has piercing sucking mouth parts to um, feed on the sap of plants. It's native to um, several parts of Asia, and it was first detected in the US in 2014 um, in Pennsylvania. Although we think that by the time that that population was detected, it had already been there probably several years. Um, in large populations, their feeding damage can kill host plants such as grapevines, um, but usually it's not necessarily the killing of the trees that we're worried about. It's, um, it's really the large amount of excrement that they produce. You can see in some of these pictures, they congregate in large groups while they feed and um, they're sucking out basically sugar water from the plant and that's what they're producing too. So you can imagine if your picnic table or your car or your kid's play set is underneath the tree where there are thousands of these, um, it becomes unpleasant. It makes it sticky. Um, it attracts bees and wasps who like the sugar um, and it grows sooty mold on it, which is like a black powdery mold that's kind of gross too. And all of these pictures um, were taken in 2021 in Southern Indiana at the first confirmed find of spotted lanternfly in the state. They're really kind of beautiful. I hate to say it. Um, I think they're. I think they're beautiful. Um, they are a plant hopper. A lot of times, people think they're a moth, and I can see why they think that. Um, but they're not a moth. They're a plant hopper. They're about an inch wide, um, or an inch long, and about half an inch wide. They have a forewing that's gray with black spots, and then they have an underwing, a hindwing that's red um, with black and white stripes. They're really unique. There's not a lot of other things that look like this. They've been found feeding on a lot of different um, plants so far. Their favorite by far is tree of heaven, um, which is unfortunate because that's an invasive species as well that is really, really common in Indiana. They also have a strong preference for walnuts and grapevines. So we're, we're pretty concerned about this um, as far as the winery and vineyard industries are concerned. So the, the adults um, in late summer through the fall, they're laying egg masses, um, which you can see in the top left and bottom left. Um, the eggs hatch the next spring and the nymphs spent, spend all spring and summer um, feeding and growing. You have um, three nymphal instar stages that are black with white dots shown in um, kind of the bottom left. I don't know if you can see my mouse, that third instar spotted lanternfly. Um, they're pretty small like an eighth to a quarter of an inch. And then they develop into a fourth instar, which is bright red uh, with white and black dots on it. And even though they're pretty distinct, they still can be pretty hard to see because they are small and a lot of times they rest on the underside of the branch in the shadow. Um, the adults and the egg masses also tend to be pretty difficult to see um, because of their coloration. The egg masses in particular sometimes just look like a natural part of the bark or they look like lichen or mud that got splattered on there. Um, the newly laid egg masses shown in the bottom left, those are a little bit brighter and easier to see, but still, um, if you weren't looking for it, you probably would never even think, oh, that's an egg mass. <coughs> um, movement of the spotted lanternfly, just like every single one of these that I've talked about, it's pretty much through human dispersal. 
Um, they've moved along highways and railroad corridors in particular, and just think about those egg masses um, that are so indistinct that gets laid on a train car and moved a thousand miles away and then suddenly it's in a brand new area. Um, they really like areas with abundant tree of heaven, like highways and railroad corridors. Um, and although their feeding preferences do change with their life development, they always feed on tree of heaven if it's there. It was found in Switzerland County, uh, bottom uh, southeast corner of Indiana this past summer. Since that initial report, um, we've had a lot of members of state agencies, including mine and federal agencies, continue surveying for it there um, to find out how big is the, the infestation, um, where is it, and also um, surveying for Tree of Heaven. We've done some treatments already. Um, we've done insecticide treatments on their host trees. Uh, we've started using traps and we have um, done kind of a trap tree thing where we cut down a lot of the small tree of heaven, which then concentrates uh, the feeding on the large tree of heaven, which then we treat those trees with the insecticide. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say about this was that um, spotted landfly has probably already been there for several years by the time we found it. Um, we will continue to treat and survey for it um, in 2022. I do not personally believe that eradication is possible, but I do think it's possible to slow the spread of it. Um, so in general about invasive species, there are a lot of things that um, every single person can do. Um, the biggest thing is that you should stay informed, um, which I'm happy you're here so you can do that. Um, but this is probably the second biggest thing is do not move firewood from one place to another. Um, at this time, there's at least 140 known pest insects that can be moved in or on firewood, um, including almost everything I talked about today. So if something killed your tree and then you take the wood from that tree and move it 100 miles away, you may be transporting whatever killed it. So buy firewood where you're going to use it. Um, we also at DNR certify firewood um, and the USDA certifies firewood as well. So um, you can buy pest-free wood. When you're moving your camping equipment, like I said, check it for egg masses before you go somewhere. Um, there's several other things in here that pertain more to other types of pests like fish and um, plants, like cleaning your boots, cleaning your boats. Um, you should be aware that you can't just freely move agricultural commodities wherever you want without checking first. Um, there are a lot of places that do have quarantines um, so check with us if you're planning to send agricultural products anywhere. And <laughs> lastly, if you, uh, just because you can buy something online doesn't mean that you should. Um, there's a lot of stuff like on Etsy and Amazon that is illegal to send across state lines or send to another country or to possess. Um, and unfortunately, the, there are just not enough of us to handle that adequately. So don't buy stuff online just because you can. Check first. Um, a lot of ways to report things. Um, if you're planning to report invasive plants, we'd like you to use EdMaps, um, which is an app or a website that you can access on your phone. Um, that's really good for reporting things like garlic mustard, purple loosestrife, stuff where we may want to be aware where it is, but we're not necessarily going to go out and manage it at this time. Um, but it's good to know where those things are. Um, if it's anything that I talked about today, that's a lot more of an emergency and we want you to report it to DNR quickly. Um, so you can call our hotline, which is listed there. I also did put my, um, my specific cell number and email there if you want to contact me directly. Um, we have, I cover nine counties in the state and I have eight other coworkers who also have their own territory. So um, if you do contact us, tell us what county you saw it in so that we can have the right person contact you. The other thing that I want to say is we really need you to include a picture or a specimen if possible. Um, we get so many reports where someone just says, I saw a giant hornet. I'm sure it's Asian giant hornet, but they didn't take a picture. They didn't capture it. It's at the time that cicada killers are flying. And I mean, I'm probably not going to go out and look for it unless I really believe that that's what it is. Um, so we might miss some positive reports if you don't take a picture. So take a picture. Um, okay. I think that's everything I have to say. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Um, my coworker, Christy, provided the slides. So I want to say thank you to her too.